this is another edition of this is another edition of the past virtual chapter and I'm just going to swap around. So hello everybody and welcome to another edition of the past business intelligence virtual chapter. We've got an SSIS focused session for you today with Cohen Verbeek. I'm so delighted we've got another European speaker today and I'm really looking forward to this session. So before we start, um, I'm just going to share some past community news with you. So for those of you that have attended past summits 2014, um, I hope you had a great time. I know that I certainly did. Uh, you can head over to the site and buy the downloads or if you attend your local user group, they might have be showing some of these sessions. So we have a whole lot of virtual chapter sessions. We actually have 28 virtual chapters in all and you can see here we've got everything from business analytics, application development, right through to global Chinese and women in technology. So here's a select number of virtual chapter meetings. So what we have, first of all, is we have the virtual chapter meeting. We have one in Russian and that's on Wednesday. And fortunately I can read that says Power Pivot and Power View and SharePoint. Um, so I definitely, if you do speak Russian, I'd head over. I'm pleased to say that the gentleman who won the Passion Award this year is Russian. Andrei Korshikov and Andrei um, looks after the Global Russian Virtual Chapter. So I would head on over to take a look. And we also have the Global French Virtual Chapter and that's Retour Experience to Pass Summit 2014 and that is also on, on Wednesday. We also have Spanish. I don't speak any Spanish, I'm sorry. I'll need to leave that with you. But I do have to say that the Spanish Virtual Chapter have got a session every week from now to the end of the year. So they, if you know anyone who speaks Spanish, would definitely tell them to have a look at that chapter. It's really vibrant. Also got Global Chinese. I know what you're thinking, Jennifer will never know what that says. Well, actually it says had it reboot. <laughs> and I know that because I had a sneaky peek at the abstract. So if you do know anyone who speaks Chinese and they're interested in learning about big data and Hadoop, I recommend you head over to that session. Again, it's in November the 19th. And we have the performance and the Hebrew website. We've got the sessions for them. The performance session is an index fragmentation with Noam Brezis, who's also doing a session in Hebrew for the Global Hebrew Virtual Chapter. So thank you very much, Noam, for doing that. And finally, we have the Professional Development Virtual Chapter session on November the 25th. That's with Kevin Klein. So if I were you, I would definitely head over there and listen to that session. That should be a good one. I'm looking forward to that one. We also have a range of other sessions as well. And you can find those at virtualchapters.sequelpass.org. So we have a whole lot of SQL Saturday events coming up. I'm delighted to say that we have London Business Analytics Edition on this Saturday. And I know that because I'm the organizer. And we have Parma, which is on the same day. We also, the rest of the year, we have events worldwide. We have Istanbul, Lima, Slovenia, Israel and El Salvador. In North America, we have got Winnipeg, Washington, Charleston, Nashville and Austin. Definitely head over to that site. This is only a selection of the Seagull Saturday events. It's not all of them. So if you think there might be one in your area, we we'll definitely have a look. So if you're interested in volunteering with PASS, um, I recommend you head over to the PASS website and sign up. We have a lot of very dedicated volunteers and PASS wouldn't function without them. And one of our volunteers is speaking today, Cohen, and we're very, very delighted to have him along to share his expertise with us. Oops, that's going to start the website. So the Outstanding Volunteer Award. If you think there's someone in your community who's done an outstanding um, effort for PASS and for the community, why not nominate them? There's a website there, no volunteer recognition at seagullpass.org. And we also have the Passion Award. It's not too early to start to nominate someone for next year. And as I say, Andrei Korshikov won this year, so he gets the award back home. 
So how do we stay involved? We sign up with a free membership at seagullbass.org and there's different ways that you can contact us. So what I'm going to do now is just pass back control to Cohen and then hopefully that should transition over to Cohen's screen and I will let Cohen Uh, introduce himself. Sorry, but that's like technical hitch. That was me, not him. So I'll hand over to Cohen, and I'll I'll get off the phone. <laughs> uh, good luck, Cohen. I'll let you introduce okay. yourself. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jen. Um, all right, everyone, welcome to the session. How to not torment your fellow integration services developer. Um, I'm gonna see if we can. Uh, you can see it, but I can. The webinar controls are a bit in the way of the presentation, but I'll, I'll deal with it. Um, so, first of all, what is the goal of this session? Um, at some point in your career, when you're developing integration services packages, you have to take a look at someone else's package. Um, either you inherit a package from a colleague which has left or, or is, is absent and you have to take a look at a bug, it, it doesn't matter, at some point in your career, you have to take a look at someone else's package. Um, this session is about when I inherit a package from someone else, how I would wish it would look like. So this is the session about when I get a package, how I wish it would look like, or if I have to hand over a package to someone else, how I would make sure the package would look like. Okay? So that's the goal of today. So there's a little bit of uh, in it for everyone, even if you're just starting with integrate services. I will not go into detail how integrate services works. Uh, I will just say so this is data flow, this is control flow, um, but you will still learn some best practices on how to do things and uh, with integration services. Also for more experienced uh, integrate services developers, developers, I've put some little tricks in here and there, uh, so you, you will still learn something at the end of this session. Okay, so a little bit about me, I'm Koen Verbeek, I'm a BI consultant for Element 61, uh, which is in Belgium, where I live, of course. Uh, I have some certification in SQL Server, I'm active in the SQL Server community, which is why I'm giving this webinar, of course. Uh, I have a blog at lessthan.com, and I also write articles for the websites msseqltips.com and intenseschool. I also have a Twitter account, so if you want, you can follow me over there. So, this is the outline for today. First of all, I'm going to give a little introduction. Then I'm going to head over to layout, because I think it's a little bit underused, but it's very important. That's my opinion, of course. Uh, the second part is uh, what is going on, which is uh, something different than documentation, because if I put documentation over there, then everybody would freak out and leave this webinar. So that's why I put what is going on instead. Then we'll talk about more best practices, and I put best practices between quotes, because uh, they change over time, they're not carved in stone, so what is true today may not will be the case uh, in a few years. What is true in SQL Server Integrate Services 2005 may well not be today with Integrate Services 2014. So that's why I put quotes around it. You don't have to take everything literal and be hardcore about it. Things can change. It's my opinion from time to time. So that's why there are quotes around best practices. Now we'll talk about performance considerations and we'll wrap everything up with a conclusion. Okay, so first of all, a little introduction. So you probably when you're watching this webinar, one of those persons and then this uh, webinar is something for you. Um, as I said before, um, this session will be for everyone who will work with integration service. If you have no experience or you have a lot of experience, I will hope you will still learn something here. Uh, and I guess that someone, uh, that everyone will at some point work on someone else's package or project. So, my point is, some integration services packages are time bombs on a server. What do I mean with that? Uh, it's possible that a package, well, it has some faulty logic inside or is the bug inside and, and it crashes on the server and you decide to take a look 
and you have no idea what the package does. So it's a little bit of a disaster because you have to spend more time at figuring out how the package works instead of actually solving the problem. Or another example, you have a package on a server, beautifully designed, it works very well, very performant, but some something happens, but you don't know what. It just crashes, but there is no logging enabled in the package. And then it becomes way harder to troubleshoot. So this is a bit of the point of the session today. So how can we avoid situations like that? So first of all, I'm going to talk about layout. So this person here, you can see on the slide, is Detective Adrian Monk. And he's a bit of a curious fellow, um, he's a bit of obsessive compulsive disorder issue, so he likes everything very neat and very organized. And I'm a bit in the same way when it comes to integration services packages. I like the neat and organized. And maybe in more popular culture you have Sheldon of the Big Bang Theory, which is also a bit of a fanatic when it comes to hygiene and then uh, having things his way. And I'm a bit the same when it comes to layout in integration services packages. For example, when I inherit a package that will look like the package in this screenshot, I'll probably have a heart attack. And I'll climb back up on my seat and I'll start to make changes to the layout. So the first thing I do is uh, organize it so that it's easier to follow the flow through the package. They can see where does everything begin, what is done in between, and where does it end, what are the successful paths, what are the error paths, and so on. And then I will try to group everything that functionally belongs together and give it decent names. So we go from a chaotic package to a more structured package. And how can we do this? Well, you have two options. You have the auto layout, auto layout uh, button. So it works pretty well, but it doesn't always do what you want to. Uh, in the old days, we saved the package, then we did the auto layout, and if we didn't like it, we just close it without saving, so we didn't lose everything. Another option is the layout toolbar, and I'll show you quickly in Visual Studio where you can find this. So I have here a very chaotic package and then I go to view and then I go to toolbars and here and we'll zoom in a little bit you have layout. And when I select all the tasks in my package you can see that the layout toolbar is highlighted over here and just with a few clicks I can put everything in the same row, I can put everything the same size, I can align everything and put equal distance between and now it looks a little bit better than before. So with just a few clicks it becomes very easy to organize your package. So now you don't really have an excuse to have chaotic packages. Okay. So back to the presentation. So the second part is documentation. So this is not you. You are not the Riddler running around in your company and trying to hide everything for your coworkers. Unless you like running around in green spandex, of course, but I guess not. So you should let other people know what the package does or at least what it's supposed to do. And my statement about this is Integration services packages are just like any other regular code. I'm going to let that sink in for a while. Integration services packages are just like any other regular code. SSIS is just the same as C-sharp or Java or whatever programming language you like to work with. Just because it's visual and you do everything with boxes and arrows doesn't make it any less true. You have inputs, you have outputs, you have parameters and everything that you have in uh, sort of everything you have in all other programming languages. In other programming languages you write documentation so you should do the same in integration services. And when I say write documentation, I don't mean for every package that you write 20 pages of Word documents, but just start with annotations. Don't write an entire novel, but just explain what the package is doing and especially use it if you're doing something peculiar. 
So I'm going to give a little demo about two little tricks and those are the kind of tricks that you typically want to document in your package because if you don't and someone else inherits your package, they don't know what you have done and it makes their life a lot harder. So let's go back to Visual Studio. And I'm going to open my package here. If I, I'm going to move a little bit around from the... Uh, can I hide this file? Well, the problem is I cannot see <laughs> everything in my Visual Studio because uh, the webinar controls are in the way. So I'm trying to see if I can hide them or something like that. So. Okay, so I've hidden it. Okay, just going to move a little bit. So sorry for the delay, people. Okay, so what I'm going to open is the clustered index insert. Let's go to the control flow. It's a very easy package. So the first task is I'm going to truncate a table, and the second task is a data flow task, where I just move data from one table to another. Just plain vanilla, nothing difficult there, and this package runs for about 35 seconds. Okay, so the optimization trick here is if the destination table has a clustered index, then you can tell integrate services, hey, maybe I will sort the data already according to the clustered index and insert it into the table sorted like the clustered index. Uh, why would I do this? Because if you insert data into a clustered index, the SQL server has to sort the data just like the index and then has to insert the index. But if the data is already pre-sorted, we can skip the sorting phase and then it speeds up a little. So I'm going to go to my other package, which is optimized. I go to the data flow. When I open the source component, you can see that I have specified an order by. So now the data is sorted. And then I can go to the destination, right click, show advanced editor, then go to component properties. And then here, I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. You can see the fast load options. And there I can specify look, the data is already sorted according to those two columns. In this case, sales order ID and sales order detail ID. So now the fast load knows, okay, the data is already sorted, I don't have to do it, I'll just dump it right into the cluster index and we gain a little bit in performance. When would you typically do this? Um, if your source table has the same type of clustered index, because then when you do the clustered index scan to read the data, well, it's already sorted according to the clustered index, so the order by, you get it for free. So this is a good optimization technique for example, having data uh, into an archive table and you have the same clustered index and then, okay, you get the order by for free and then you say, okay, the data is already sorted, so you gain a little bit in performance. And let's check the execution results and we can see here that it now ran, sorry, for about 31 seconds. So we gained 15 seconds just by sorting the data uh, before we inserted it into the clustered index. So this is typically something that you want to put an annotation, say, look what I did here in the advanced editor of the destination component, because it's something you don't really see when you're editing the packages. It's a bit well hidden. Uh, so you have to let the other developers know what you did there, because maybe they they delete the order by because they say, why, why is there an order by? You don't need it. They, they delete it out of the source query and now you don't, the results are not guaranteed to be sorted and everything can happen. So it's something you need to let other people know. So now I have another package. <coughs> and I got, it's column file name. So just another basic package. I'm going to loop over some text files, something that well, probably most of us have already done uh, in, in projects. So we loop over flat files and we just dump them inside a SQL Server table. Well, for auditing purposes, uh, my manager wants that there's also a column that uh, stores the file path to the flat file where the data was read from. So the most known option 
that in the for each loop you go to collection and you say okay retrieve the file name sort inside a variable and then you can use that variable inside a derived column and then you sort inside your table. It's not too hard but I'm a little bit lazy and it happens to be that I know an easier option. So what do I do? I right click again on my source and go to advanced editor go to component properties and here you have the property file name column name and if I put something here in my case file name the source editor will add an extra column in this case called file name that will store the full file path to the flat file so you don't have to do anything you don't have to use variables or derived uh, expressions you just say okay just add the column uh, and store the file path. So if you look here at columns, it's added over here at the bottom. And if I run the package, you can inspect in a data viewer. Indeed, the file name is over there. So also something that you want to let other people know that you did this little trick because Again, it's pretty well hidden in the advanced editor. If you go to the flat file connection manager and you say, I don't see a column file name, but it's there in the source component, so it can lead to confusion. So let other people know what you are doing in a package, especially if you're using little tricks like this one. So let's go back to the presentation. Documentation. So give meaningful names to tasks and components. Um, for example, at the bottom you see a little store procedure. Is there anybody in the audience who would name a procedure like that? Well, probably not. We're not on the mainframe anymore. We can use more than 10 characters to give names to something. So you will not name it PROC1 and parameter A and parameter B and call 1 and table B. You give it decent names. So please do the same in your integration services packages. I've seen this a lot of times, just people drag stuff onto the canvas and they don't rename it, so you get like execute SQL task 1, execute SQL task 2, 3, 4, and so on. So you should let people know at least what the task is supposed to do, and it doesn't have to be a lot of effort, just give it a decent name, like uh, insert into fact table, uh, send an email, something like that. Something that I also do is I use a naming convention. So the first uh, characters in my name are an abbreviation of the task or the transformation. For example, DFD stands for data flow. And I use a list composed by Jamie Thompson, a British SQL Server MVP. And it works really well. And when you go to logging and you see the characters, you immediately see what task failed. So it really helps, especially in the newer Visual Studios where uh, there's not a lot of color and to change the icons and I don't memorize all the icons, how they look like, then it can help if you have a name convention for your tasks. Also document your embedded code as well. So document uh, your SQL inside your execute SQL tasks, uh, document your .NET code in your script task or script transformations. Um, so the little screenshot that you saw, the special not documented rule, this is something that I actually found somewhere in production. So please document your code. Um, a little tip, you can add of the execute SQL task in the first line of code. So in the first uh, T-SQL code, you just comment it out and then you put the name of the component and then when you use profile, when you're not using extended events, then you can easily spot uh, your task in uh, the output of profile. There are also third-party documentation tools who will generate documentation for you, which might be useful if you do not like writing pages and pages of documentation. So more best practices. Again, in quotes, because some of them are opinions of me, they're not carved in stone, so. First one, very important, use source control. And I mean, use it right now. If you're not using source control already, please start using it as soon as possible. And this becomes especially important in integration in services 2012. Why? Because there you have the project deployment model. And once you work in the project deployment model, you can only deploy an entire
entire project. You cannot deploy an individual package. No, you have to deploy the entire project. Why can this be difficult sometimes? Suppose I have a package A and a package B. And both are working. And I'm working on package B. I'm adding new features to it. And suddenly, in production, there's a little bug in package A, and a colleague fixes package A and deploys everything to production, but that means it also deploys my unfinished version of package B. And suddenly I have a package B in production that doesn't work anymore. And that's where source control really becomes important. Source control, you can branch your solution and then you can branch a working version of package B instead of the non-working version. Or you could revert temporarily package B to an earlier version that was still working, deploy it and then revert it back to its most recent state. So use source control. Check out packages you are working on. Do not check out the entire project at once unless you really want to annoy your colleagues of course. Of course. Try to use only one version of uh, bits or SSDT or SSDT BI. Why am I saying this? Well, I was in a project once and they used to work with Visual Studio 2008. But they were busy migrating to Visual Studio 2010. But then one co-worker came in and on his laptop he already had Visual Studio 2012 installed. So every time someone opened the package it was automatically upgraded and at some point in time you had three different versions. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's 2008, 2010, 2012. And then, yeah, it really became hard because you open the package, oh, it, it has to upgrade, it wasn't upgraded yet, and in the source control explorer you cannot see which version it is. So it was really annoying. So my point is just try to be consistent in which type of Visual Studio you use. Okay? When you commit a package into source control, also give it a decent commit message. Just say, don't say like, oh, this was my work of today, but actually say I made this and this and this changes to the package and it will make it easier to revert back to an earlier working version. Second best practice, allow for easy troubleshooting. So this was especially important in integration services 2005, 2008 and 2008 R2. There you had to uh, explicitly enable logging um, and there you can log to the event uh, logs or you could log to XML or flat file or to a table in SQL Server. Personally, I prefer a SQL Server table because then you can create the logs pretty easily. Starting in Integrators 2012 and above, you have the project deployment model with the SSDS catalog, which uses the SSDB behind the scenes and it logs everything for you. So there it becomes less important. In the project deployment model, you have different types of logging levels. So the default one is basic. And although it names basic, well, the name is basic, it, it isn't really basic, it locks uh, errors, it locks warnings, and also informational messages. So in my opinion, that's already too much for a production system, because it locks a lot, and then the SDS catalog starts to grow up uh, really rapidly when you have a lot of package, packages running. So you have another one, it's called performance, or performance, and that one locks only errors and warning. That's typically the one you want to use unless you really want to debug something. In that case, you have verbose and that locks pretty much everything there is possible to lock. So for debugging purposes, use verbose. If not, just use the performant one and that one only locks errors and warnings. <coughs> Excuse me. Also, use audit columns. When there's an ETL process going on in your data warehouse and I take a look at a row in a table. I really like to know when it was updated, when was it inserted, by which package was it inserted, and so on and so on. So just for auditability purposes, try to use some metadata columns in your data warehouse that store everything and especially insert and update date can be really useful. Okay, develop package templates. Why would you use templates? Well, it ensures consistency, consistency across projects. For example, 
if everyone does it the same way, it becomes easier to troubleshoot uh, a coworker's package. If everyone has their own method of doing a type 2 dimension in integration services and I have to troubleshoot someone else's package, it becomes much harder because first I have to learn what they are doing and then I have to troubleshoot. Or if someone new starts at your company, then I can say, okay, this is the way we work with integrators to solve this type of scenario. Using templates, so it's very useful for common patterns and I, Andy Leonard and Matt Mason and others have written an excellent book about integration services design patterns. So for those type of patterns uh, like loading a dimension, loading a fact table like type 1, type 2 dimensions, uh, loading a staging table, reading a flat file, typically tasks that are almost always the same, those are the kinds of packages you want to use a template for. If you really want to be doing it the awesome way, then you could use BIML uh, or BIML to generate the packages using metadata and it really helps to shorten the development life cycle of your ETL project. So common patterns, try to generate them. Also lock to a central database. Um, and, uh, this is already done for you in Integration Source 2012 and above, but in 2005, 2008, R2, uh, it's usual if you have a lot of packages and projects going on, if they all log to the same database so everything is centralized and it becomes easier to tie packages from different projects together because typically you have a large ETL run, it starts somewhere at midnight probably and it runs for a few hours and it helps if you can tie all the packages from different projects of like the import project and the staging and then loading the data warehouse. If you can tie them all together into one run uh, and then you can analyze the durations of your ETL load a bit easier. So I'm going to show you uh, quick what I think a useful pattern is. It's the absurd pattern where absurd stands for uh, update and insert. It's a very common known pattern, so I guess probably most people will already know it, um, but I'll go over it and explain how I typically implement it. So first of all, I'm going to create an update table. Um, why do I do this? Well, the only way you can do updates in a data flow is by using the OLEDB command, but the OLEDB command does the updates row by row, which means extremely slow. So what do I do instead? I use a staging table, I dump all my updates in it and then in the third step here I use an uh, update statement to do the update in one big set based update and it's a lot faster. So first I create my staging table, I do my data flow, do the update and then drop the staging table. The data flow looks like this, I read from my source, I add my audit columns of course and then in the lookup I check if, it, if a row is an insert or an update and very important, always use a SQL query for your lookup component. Uh, it makes it a lot faster and it doesn't have to read all the columns of your table, which it does if you use the drop down. So don't use a drop down, always use a SQL query, it will make your packages a lot faster. And then I will match on business key and I will retrieve the surrogate key and I will store the surrogate key alongside with the updates in the staging table. So if a match is found, it means a row is an update. If a match wasn't found, it means the row is new, so it's an insert and I directly fast load it into the destination table. So let's take a look how this update statement looks like. So I will maximize it and here you can see, okay, just a typical update statement uh, and I can join between my, this, my the dimension here and between my staging table and I can join directly on my surrogate key because I retrieved it in the lookup component so it's a very fast join and the update is typically very fast. I also have a very elaborate where clause where I check if an update is actually an update, if the actual values have changed or not. And now you're saying, Kuhn, this is way too much typing work. I don't want to do this, so much typing. Well, I'm going to show you a little trick how I can create such an update statement uh, a little bit faster just by using copy-paste. 
So I'm going to select all my columns that I need. So these are the columns. I copy them. And here I have a skeleton already prepped uh, for my update statement. And I'm going to say, OK, update here. Remove that comma over here. And now we're going to show you a little trick using the Alt key. So you hold the Alt button. And while you hold the Alt, Alt button and you drag with your mouse, you can select a block. So instead of selecting entire lines, you select only a block. So I can just select a line over here. And the great part is now I can type at all selected lines at once. So I can just say equals uh, u dot. And then I go to the top line and just go, oh, sorry, I select with the Alt button, my columns again, like this, go to the top line and copy paste them all at once. And for the where clause, it's just the same, like I type where, paste my columns, put a comma in front, no, you put an or over here, okay, like this, select a line again, Okay, and say where it's different from uh, u dot. And then paste my columns again. And of course, I have to alias the first ones here as well. So like this and like this. So in just a, what, under a minute, I made my update statement. Uh, with just a copy pasting, which is very useful if you have a very big dimension with hundreds of columns, then this little trick can really be a time saver. Okay, so let's go back to the presentation. So this was my absurd pattern. So my next best practice, aim for restartability, and you can do it with KISS, and KISS is the KISS principle, which stands for uh, keep it simple, stupid. Don't create huge single packages, rather create smaller, smaller packages, which means uh, don't have a gigantic package that does everything at once, and uh, import a flat file, do some data quality checks, and then transformation, and then load it inside the database. No, just uh, do the import in one package, uh, do the checks in another package and do the loading in yet another package. And then when the second one fails, you only have to run the second or the third one and you can skip the first one. So restartability becomes a lot better when you have smaller packages and also the package becomes easier to understand. Okay? Um, packages should be idempotent, which means if you run a package multiple times in a row, it should always produce the same output. Uh, maybe at the start of the package you have to do some cleanup, maybe delete some rows or whatever. Uh, you have to make sure if you run a package twice, uh, nothing is uh, being harmed. Uh, everything is intact and everything is as it's supposed to be. And I couldn't find a really good screenshot for item potent, so that's why there's a picture of a cute little kitten uh, on this slide. In an ETL run, also keep track of where you are, especially when executing in parallel. Uh, why is this? Well, typically you have a table and you list all the packages that you want to run, but if you're running in parallel and like you have five packages in parallel and then one fails and the other four succeed, you don't want to run those four again. So using that table, just store, okay, these are the packages I want to run uh, and set like to load equals uh, to one. and when a package has successfully finished, it goes to that table, looks for its own name, and then updates it the to load column to zero. Uh, and when something crashes, you just say, okay, give me all the packages from my, uh, from my metadata table, uh, where to load is still equal to one, and then you only have to run the packages again that were not run yet or failed in the previous attempt. So try to keep track of, of where you are, in your ETL run so that you only start where you need to start. You don't have to do the same work over and over again. You could use checkpoints in integrators, but to be honest, I don't really like them, so typically I build something of my own. Performance considerations. Like there are three types of integration services transformations. You have like the blocking, the semi-blocking, 
and the non-blocking. Uh, and you should avoid the blocking components at all costs. And those are like the sort and aggregate component um, because they have to read all the data into memory before they can even output one single row. So typically, uh, don't use them, use this sequence set. If you want to do an order by, uh, so use an order by in this sequel, do not use a sort component, use a group by in this sequel, just don't use the SDS components unless you're working with really small data sets. Uh, typically people say, yeah, but what if I'm reading from an Excel file, for example, I can't use this sequel, and I say, just read the Excel file, dump it to a staging table, and then use the SQL, and it will probably be faster than you do everything in integrated service. So the, the clue here is try to find a good balance between using the memory pipeline in integrated services and the power of the SQL. Um, components can also be synchronous and asynchronous. So synchronous means the buffer that comes in and the buffer that comes out is the same. The number of rows that go in are the same as the number of rows that go out. While asynchronous means the buffers are changed, either are smaller or bigger, well, they change somehow. So it's possible that the component is not blocking, but if it changes the buffers, it becomes asynchronous, like for example the union all, and it can still have a performance impact. So try to avoid uh, semi-blocking and blocking. So those are typically asynchronous. And the union all, for example, is a non-blocking component, but it's still asynchronous. So basically avoid asynchronous, go for synchronous. Okay. Try to avoid row by row transformations as well. Uh, and typically I mean the ODB command because that one is really evil and really slow. This is a screenshot of a package that I found in production, and this actually go back to the, the KISS principle, like keep it simple, stupid. What you see here is a gigantic conditional split that checks if incoming rows are either updates, inserts, uh, or if they're a type 1 update or a type 2 in the update for a dimension, or if it's a delete. And it checks this for every column. And actually this pattern is not that bad. It performs pretty well unless you have 150 columns, like is the case in this package. So this is also my point of like there are best practices but they're not carved in stone, so checking for updates and insert is usually a best practice, but if your conditional split has over 150 expressions, well, the package be becomes very unwieldy, it becomes very hard to maintain. So to be honest, the package run okay, in production, the performance was acceptable, but it took 15 minutes to open the package in Visual Studio just to edit it. So 15 minutes of drinking coffee before you can even make a change to the package. This is the kind of moment where I have to start, okay, maybe I have to build my package in another way. I'm going to skip this demo because I think I've like seven minutes left, but I wrote a blog post about it and I mentioned the blog post in my resources at the end, so you can check it out over there. Um, so finally, you have the buffer, so the data flow and integration of this like a pipeline where data flows through, and you really have to look at it like it's an actual pipeline. The data flows through using memory buffers, um, and you have to try to avoid, for example, back pressure. If your destination is too slow, then uh, you have back pressure, and then your, store, your source uh, starts to get slower as well. So you can fiddle around with the buffer sizes uh, in hope to fix this, um, but most importantly you have to find the bottleneck. So first of all you delete the destination. Is your package still slow? Delete some transformation. Is it still slow? Delete some more transformation. At the end, if only the source is left and the package is still slow, then the bottleneck is at the source. So try to play a little bit around with, uh, with the buffer sizes. In 99% of the cases, a bigger buffer is better, okay? Bigger is better, like in almost case, there are some edge cases where a small buffer, uh, if you have a very slow source, can be faster, but most of the time that is, uh, bigger is better. A smaller can be better, but edge case. Also be very careful with data types. Integrate services estimates the buffer size using the column width 
of uh, all the columns used in the buffer. If you have like very large columns like Varghar 4000, integrate services will assume there will always be a string of 4000 characters inside it, even if there are only 30 characters inside it. It doesn't matter. It will all take the maximum possible value and use that to estimate the buffer size. If that becomes large, it means there can be less rows inside one buffer. So if you make your column smaller, you can put more rows into one buffer and your package gets faster. So I'm going to show you a little demo of a use case that I encountered at a project. It's about data types and NVP, and NVP stands for Name Value Pair. So it was a Name Value Pair table uh, that was a source and it has one column with a description and then one column with the actual value. And you can store everything. The problem is if you want to store everything in one column, well, the column has to be big because yeah, it has to store everything. So it stores personal information, it stores email addresses, uh, and it stores uh, personal addresses and phone numbers and everything. And it was like 4,000 or 5,000 characters wide. Well, for my dimension, I tried to load, I only needed the email addresses. But email addresses are typically not 4,000 characters long. They're usually smaller than 100 characters. So I could optimize the package a lot by playing with the data types. So I will go to Visual Studio, close this one, close this one, close my package. So here is my package. So just lock something, truncates the destination, does a data flow and unlocks the end. And the data flow is again really simple, reads the email addresses, uses some audit columns and then writes it to the destination. And the source query is really simple. Okay, read from my name value pair table where the type is email address. In that case, I get all my email addresses. Okay, so here are all the email addresses. Well, you can already see on the warning here, there's a little bit of a problem because, well, in my dimension, I know, and if it would show the warning, yes, it says, okay, you try to put something with a very big length in a, to a very small column, but I know email addresses are smaller than 100 characters. So my, in my dimension, I have a Varkar 100, but uh, Varkar 100, yes. But at my source, it's a Varkar 4000 or something like that. So a bit of a data time mismatch. So when the package runs, it runs pretty long for over a minute. This is because you couldn't put a lot of rows into one buffer because, well, I have a very big column and it uses all the space into the buffer. So the first thing I did is try to make the buffers a little bit bigger. So in that case, I can put more rows in it and the package will go faster. And you can do this at the data flow properties. You have two properties, default buffer max rows and default buffer size. So I upped it both, I uh, made the default size to 20 megabytes and I said, okay, you should try to put around 30,000 rows into one buffer. When I made the buffers bigger, then I got an execution result about 23 seconds. So it ran about three times as fast just by modifying some properties. So this is performance tip number one, make your buffers bigger. But I wasn't happy yet. I had to make it even more faster. So what did I do? I go to my data flow, went to the source query, and I used a cost to make the email the appropriate length. And now I could put 10 times as more row into one single buffer because my gigantic column was gone. Okay, it was 100 times as small. And when I run the package now, I get an execution speed of 11 seconds. Here you go. So I went from over one minute to about 20 seconds uh, just by enlarging the buffers and then by making the data types appropriate, I could even make it uh, double as fast. So I end up with 11 seconds. So performance tuning, make your buffers bigger, and make your columns smaller. Okay. So we're at the end of the presentation. So if you care for your fellow integration services developer, try to pay attention to the layout, to the names of the transformation and the tasks, try to put a little bit of documentation, use annotations, uh, try, uh, 
do enable locking in earlier version of an integrated services or if you use the project deployment model in 2012, this is already done for you. Use source control. I don't really care what you use, if it's a hit or if it's a subversion or whatever, uh, or team foundation server, just to use it. I, I also think there's a version of team foundation server that's also free, so it has a little bit of limited functionality, but for most cases it will be perfectly fine. So you have no excuse, use source control. Keep packages short, simple and item potent and remember performance. Avoid asynchronous and blocking transformations and check the buffer size when you're developing packages. The default is 10,000 rows in a buffer and a size of 10 megabytes, so at least triple it for every package that you have in your project. So these are some resources that I used to make this presentation. Uh, so now is the time that I'm at the end of the presentation. So you can ask questions. Um, and I think if there are questions, Jen will uh, show them to me. Um, this yes. is my contact information. Okay, yes. Hello there, we just had one small question. It's okay, from yeah. Kapila. It says she wants to know, is SQL Merge better than SSIS Merge? <coughs> That's a great question. So, is it better? Well, it depends. Um, you, um, so when you use the merge in integration, so the built-in component in integration service, I would say no, the SQL is way better. Um, why? Because if you use the merge or the merge join in integration, you need to have sorted inputs and sorted inputs means yeah, slow. Uh, if you have a relational source, you mean uh, you have to use the order by. Uh, which means a little bit of a performance loss. If you don't have not a relational source, it means you have to use a source component, uh, which is blocking an integrator, so it has to read all the data into memory and everything becomes really slow. So I avoid the merge join at all costs. Um, the downside of the SQL merge is that everything has to be loaded already into the database, into the same database, uh, or into the same database instance, and then you can use the merge table. There are also a little bit of downside to the merge. Um, those are more the DBA uh, gurus that know more about it. I think Aaron Bertrand, uh, a SQL Server MVP, has written a bit of uh, a, a few articles about some of the bugs in merge over the performance limitation. But typically, it's a pretty good statement. Although its syntax is quite hard to use, I think nobody ever achieved in uh, memorizing the entire syntax or merge, but it's a pretty good thing. Personally, I use my upsearch pattern. I read from the source, I use a lookup component, determine if it's an update or an insert, uh, write to a staging table, and then check if an update is an actual update or not, either in the update statement or if it's a really big table, maybe I use a hash value. So if the hash value of the entire row has changed and something in the row has changed, then I can update the row. So personally, I would go for either the upsert pattern or for the T-SQL merge, but I will always try to avoid the merge join in integration services itself. So a very long answer for a very short question. That was a great answer, thank you. We just had a few more questions. Uh, one, they're kind of related. One is uh, how can people get a copy of your slide deck? And someone else is asking about um, can they see the resources screen again? Oh, um, yeah. Well, that yeah, should sorry to there. <laughs> Go ahead, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I will go back to my presentation and I will go to resource. But you can download the slide deck, of course. I already uh, uploaded it to SlideShare because I did this presentation for the SQL Server days. Um, so I will go to uh, my blog, which is at lessthandot.com. So if you go to lessthandot.com, you go to blogs, and then you see my name here in the author list and I have here somewhere like I, I here I here it is SQL Server Days 2014 slide deck and there is a link to SlideShare and there you can download the entire presentation which also has the resources slides which I will put back on the screen. 
Thank you very much. So we've just got a few more questions. Uh, it's yeah, good sure. to see them coming in. Um, uh, Richard says that your update is quite an involved where clause and wondered if you thought about using a conditional split instead. Um, yeah, it's true, true. And if there are not too many columns, I may use a conditional. I have packages lying around that use a conditional split instead. But I dislike the conditional split a bit. It's a good component, but uh, it's a one-line editor and it doesn't really type well and the intelligence, there is no actual intelligence and uh, it's hard uh, to work with it. So I prefer writing T-SQL, especially if there are a lot of columns. But if they say I have a very small dimension, like four columns, chances are I will use a conditional split instead. Or, as I mentioned earlier, that I calculate a hash value and I will just check if the hash value has changed and that I will surely do in a conditional split because I only have to check one column. Thank you very much. That's a good answer. Um, we just sort of, we keep getting questions, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, no problem. One is just a formatting question. How do you keep annotations close to the transforms when you do auto layout? Well, I don't use auto layout. <laughs> so I said in my presentation that yeah, it's it's an option, uh, but I don't use. It. I do everything myself using the auto auto layout toolbar. Uh, I really don't use uh, the auto layout. I only use the toolbar because I'm a control maniac. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the same actually. It just annoys me. Everything jumps around. I've been using SSIS like you for some time and I remember the older versions where you would auto layout and half of the screen would disappear because it would have got so large. So yeah, I indeed. put off using it. <laughs> so I wonder, uh, they've got one last question. Uh, people yeah. are wanting to know if there's any um, advantages for SSIS in 2014. Um, if there was anything specifically for SSIS? No, I have to think, but I don't really mm. think they released something new but in the box. They didn't release anything new, but uh, they have, for example, a new OData source component. But you can also download it for 2012 as well. Um, so the only advantage maybe is that uh, you also can use Visual Studio 2013 instead of the older versions, but there's not, that I can recall at this moment, um, new functionality inside the box. Um, nowadays, when the Integrate Services team releases new feature, they typically release it on Codeplex first, like the old data source was first at Codeplex, and then you can download it over there, and if they see it's well received and used, then they add it maybe uh, into the feature pack of SQL Server, or maybe into the final product. But I have to say for 2014, I don't think there are a lot of new features or advantages. Um, the biggest change was with 2012 and the project deployment model. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think with SSIS in particular for 2014, um, mm -hmm. there's no major changes. And I think because a lot, they focused on a lot of other things for 2014, that particular subsystem of SQL Server yeah. um, wasn't um, up, up changed in any way. And I think it's regarded as quite a mature product. It's been around since 2005. So, And there's lots of other exciting things happening in SQL Server. 2014, so I guess SSIS has um, not been the focus of the Hecaton stuff, for example. Yeah, indeed. Right, so I've had a quick look and that's us, that's all our questions. Um, I've just a few comments, people saying that they had a fantastic um, learning session and um, just great feedback really, just to say thank you very much. Um, and uh, someone has said, um, that uh, they've picked up a lot of handy tips during the session, so that's good. And someone else has said that they share our frustration with auto layout, <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's true. With that, I will leave it there, and um, just remains to say thank you very much. And we no will be posting up the video on YouTube, and I'll do that just now, and it should go up later this afternoon by the time I've compressed it for YouTube and posted it up. But that was a great session, and if you ever want to come back and uh, deliver any sessions in the future, we'd be more than happy to have you back. But thank you very much for doing that for us. No, no problem. It was my pleasure. And thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity 
uh, to do my session. Oh, we'll be glad to have you. Anytime, anytime. <laughs> That's great. Well, thank you so much, and wherever you are in the evening in the world, uh, good morning, good evening, and good night, and enjoy SQL Server. <laughs> thanks, everyone. Bye. All right, thanks for listening. You too. Bye.